Well, welcome everyone. I'm glad you are here. And uh, <clears throat> I'm excited about the opportunity and some of a lot of new faces and, um, and some um, ones that I'm quite familiar with. So glad to see a mixture of both. We're going to dive into a little bit of a conversation that I think will challenge the best of us. And, and the reason why I say that is when we talk about really thinking differently about how we design uh, in light of genius or in light of uh, what we'll discuss today, a move from kind of an industrialized system, it really is more prevalent and more a part of our thinking than we realize. So my approach today will be doing a little bit of a uh, identifying and showing how that is became such a strong part of what we do and how we design, and then began to move in the direction of what does it look like for us to design differently. So I'll share my screen and, and we will um, move forward. So as we began to talk about this, this will be, and I call it discovering genius and releasing potential at work. Uh, we will get into a little bit of what it may mean for you personally, but I'm actually going to encourage you to, uh, to embrace our unique genius workbook, download it, it's free. And, and that would be a great process for you as an individual to go through. We're going to step back and talk more about why is it important to discover genius and how do we release it at work? And so in terms of expectations, we're gonna talk about why we should even redesign the current system, why genius should even be an essential consideration in that design and how regeneration or a regenerative framework uh, can be essential to new potential. So I'm gonna start with this question. And feel free to use the chat or feel free to unmute. But what is the real energy source for organizations? Awesome, love it. Some people are saying people. Now, what, what do most people think the most the energy source is for uh, most organizations. Yes, everybody, money, right? So what's interesting is, is we're gonna reframe the idea of if, if the real energy source of an organization is people, then we should be designing around people. Unfortunately, the majority of the organizations and institutions that we know are well aware of are tend to be designed for the outcome or money as a energy source. So when we start to begin to shift this, recognize that the energy source for an organization is not money, but it is people, we begin to want to look at, so now if that's the case, then people should be thriving in organizations, correct? Shouldn't that be? If we all know that the energy source of an organization is people, then everybody should be thriving, right? But that seems to be very different from the engagement rates that we see. Gallup talks about, in essence, how 50 to 60% of the employee base or staff base of US and even global organizations are disengaged. And it's not just uh, disengagement, it's also in terms of how we see it, it's not even limited to just a single generation. Sometimes this has been blamed on millennials, right? This is not a millennial issue. Uh, this is quite an issue across all generations from Xers to boomers to uh, the traditionalists, all recognizing that there is some substantial disengagement rate. When you think about actively disengaged and not engaged, you know, it could be in the best situation, north of 50%. And we begin to recognize that because of this disengagement, because of this current design, it's really influenced and impact the well-being 
of most people. And, uh, and even Gallup would go as far as to say that it has really brought out a lot of what they call negative emotions, worry, stress, anger, and sadness. And all of that is creating a condition that allows right now roughly seven in 10 employees are struggling or suffering rather than thriving. And I want to stress that in addition to just our moral or societal commitment to ensuring that people can thrive, it does have a financial cost. And they're estimating roughly 10% of global GDP is a result of disengagement rates, which is roughly $8.1 trillion. So now when we think about all of the things that are not working, we, we do see it, this as a design issue and one that becomes really important for us to address because there is a design that has, is a complete mismatch. And, but it, it, it came from some substantial success. You know, our current design of an organization isn't the way it is because somebody just thought about it, you know, in a dream and decided to put it to work. It was because there were some incredible thinkers, mostly during the Renaissance, from Newton and others, who began to recognize there were some incredible insights to seeing science and recognizing rationalism and logic and cause and effect and being able to predict and control outcomes. And all of those discoveries became the foundation for a lot of our Western civilization. Now, what was so interesting is that all of that was so convincing that you will find that it began to be applied to all parts of our human life. You know, this scientific reductionist mechanistic approach now was applied to social systems, applied to living systems like natural systems, not just mechanical or machines. And because of that success, we embraced it wholeheartedly. And there are some incredible thinkers that really took it to its extreme. And in particular, uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor began to take those insights that came from Newton and this reductionist approach and apply it to organizational design. He said this was the best form of management in 1909. And he went on as far as to say that for us to have that best uh, sort of management, that this principled approach based on these scientific insights, that we would see people very differently. And one of the requirements they said for someone who was in essence holding or handling a pig iron was that he should be so stupid and so phlegmatic that he more resembles the mental makeup of an ox than any other type. Now, I don't know about you, but when we began to recognize the application of applying these kinds of principles to how we manage organizations and the people that are a part of them, it is stark what happens. So I don't see that this disengagement rate is an anomaly. It is an absolute result of the current design. So when we think about what the most dominant model for organizations is the machine. And, and I use the word model. Sometimes you'll hear me talk about metaphors. It, it is more than a metaphor for us in the US and in Western civilization. It has become a model. We use the design of a machine as a means to inform the design of our organizations. And so it has become replicated in all kinds of different forms. And particularly, we see it in how we design our businesses and how we talk about it and how we talk about continuous improvement and functions within it. We see schools, economies as machines. We recognize and even call out the human body as a machine. Think of yourself as a machine operating within a machine and know that you have the ability to alter your machines to produce better outcomes. That all came from this industrialized design. And our language mirrors it all. Working like a well-oiled machine, I don't have bandwidth, I gotta dial that in, or I need to move the new needle on that. All those things I'm sure you've heard yourself say. And, and all of that, when you think about the context of an individual, it, it says some deep things about our philosophy, 
in our approach, in the application of what we're talking about. So much so that we even know the satirists began to apply this because we began to see things very, very differently. And I love this part of Dr. Seuss when he says, just pay me your money and hop right aboard. And they clamored inside. The big machine roared and it plunked and it bunked and it jerked and it burked and it bopped them out and about. But the thing really worked. When the plain belly snatchers popped out, they had stars. They actually did. They had stars upon stars. And the, the reality is, is we began to see everything in this kind of assembly line design because it works when we talk about machines. But what is a machine? And this is just a dictionary definition, but a machine is a structure that uses power to apply force and control movement to perform an intended action. That's just the definition of a machine. Now, I'm just gonna replace one word. An organization is a structure that uses power to apply force and control movement to perform an intended action. So imagine how we have designed most organizations and the people within those organizations, we've applied power and control to manage a particular action so that we could get a specific outcome. And all of that is tied to our design. Now, let's talk about this. How much time does the average person spend in an organization? Any guesses? It's an incredible amount of time. 90,000 hours, one third of someone's lifetime. Now, now think about this. One third is at the workplace. One third is sleeping. And the other third is in other activities that an individual may be a part of. So in essence, 50% of your awake time is at the workplace, 50%. So now imagine what it would be like if you spend 50% of your awake time in a place that does nothing but continue to degrade you. So what is the outcome of a design where people are just replaceable parts in the cog? Those outcomes really become, you know, tied to this idea that we're just, we're looking for an escape. I mean, think about it. I mean, I, I all have to do is, I don't have to think too far back in my own life to recognize how often we personally design strategies to escape the workplace. Because it's not giving us life. It's all a means so that we can live life someplace else. And I often tell the In Rhythm team, we've got such an unhealthy relationship with work and the design is as such that it degrades us that our strategy is to get the hell out. And books like the four hour work week and everything else is how can we change it to be able to have a different experience versus what I'm encouraging and what we're working towards at In Rhythm is how can the workplace be an environment that can give life? So when we think about life as a metaphor versus the machine, we began to look for insights and Maturana and Varela from the Santiago School in Chile began to give us some insights into how we could think about life and see it differently. And it's, it's a bridge to us being able to really think through how we would like to design our experience, the quality of life that we want. And this is not new. Um, there are many indigenous cultures and wisdom traditions that have really embraced this kind of approach, but it has not been really adopted within the workplace. And so when we think about the principles that show up, when we think about life in mind, <clears throat> we think about some incredible things that could give us some insights in how we should design. 
that life isn't located in any one place, that it's dependent upon all its interconnected relationships, that it's holistic and emergent as a part of its overall design, and that all the different aspects of that system are regenerative. And even so much so, they, they coined a term at the Santiago School called autopoesis, which is this idea of self-poetry, right? I don't know about you, but I would much rather be a part of a system that's trying to understand its rhythm, the poetry in it all, versus just parts in a cog. So even the greatest designers of all time, but Mr. Fuller said, that if we designed with life-centered principles, the universe would pitch in to help. And sometimes I think when I'm talking to CEOs or talking to uh, organizations, they're like, well, I mean, I hear you, Trey. This is, yeah, this is something we should do, but I can't make money doing that. That is not true. Uh, the reality is, is there is so much potential in an organization that is capped or unrealized because our designs limit the engagement. Now, now, just think about this. I just want you to use and think about the logic that's used. If you had a machine and that machine was only able to do and be engaged 50% of the time, what would you do? You would replace the machine. You'd say, that machine's not serving me. I'm going to replace it. So what do we do in the workplace? And somebody's, quote, not engaged, we replace. We have such a high turnover in the workplace. It is in this kind of mechanistic design. We're not working with life. We're shutting life down. And so we encourage people to take these principles. What does it mean to be holistic, interdependent, recognize the uniqueness in the system or the individuals, be able to evolve, redistribute and decentralize how we make decisions and how power shows up, and then for there to be a developmental approach. All of those change the design. So I'm going to ask this question. If we use these principles, what would change in how we would design individual roles and in organizations? Right? If you use these six principles, what would change? What would change about the organization if we use these principles to design? All right, less hierarchy. What else? Happier people, more engagement, higher engagement. I mean, think about the uniqueness that would come out if we embrace that within people and that we created conditions for people to grow and mature in those positions and that it wasn't static and it was allowed to evolve, that's right, we would have limitless potential. It would change everything. And I think that is our biggest challenge as we move forward as a society is we need to design with life in mind and designing with life in mind embraces the genius in all of us. And that is worth continuing to design around. So we need a new kind of framework to do all this. We can't do it in the existing one. The existing one was designed to produce at the expense of health. And what we need a framework that can, can still provide the outcomes that we want, but it enhances the healthy conditions within the context that we're working. So we embrace uh, this framework that we've developed where we're really using those principles to design something different. We're bringing health into the conversation. We're recognizing that all living systems, when they're healthy, create abundance. And how can we really incorporate that as a part of a design process? And so when we apply this living systems approach, it's informed by principles. And those principles create conditions that will allow us to design in a flexible, in a, in, a, in a flexible way. And that flexibility, we believe, tied with those principles, create the conditions for regeneration. Living, breathing, 
changing, evolving, maturating the systems. Now, when you think about an organization, now you think about it as a living system, not something forcing anything, but it's, it's maintaining itself. It's, it's maintaining its boundary and creating the conditions for abundance and resilience. And all of that comes from these underlying conditions of health. And so when we think about the machine design in comparison, it really engineers these best practices, which enforces these prescriptions and then degenerates the health of the system. And then what I just said informs by principles and frameworks regenerates. The work we're doing is recognizing that there is an enormous amount of energy needed in that mechanistic system. But in a living system, we need less energy because it's self-maintaining. When all of a sudden you are all fully engaged in your workplace, it brings far more energy. And we are all then about how we can participate in supporting people in the shift. Now, when we think about that, we recognize that health becomes what we are designing around. So now think about this, that machine design, you only measure machine design on one thing, outputs, and maybe efficiency. When you think about a living system, a true living system, like a garden, what are you, what are you looking for? You're looking for healthy conditions so you can produce more crops. <clears throat> and what can we do to create those healthy conditions? And you'll notice here at the top of of the organism, what we call organizational health is energy flow, thriving members. And so what we want all of us to recognize is that what Einstein said, everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. We've continued to design roles, not based on genius. We've designed roles based on productivity and efficiency. It's designed to create a particular outcome versus create conditions for health. And that's what will change everything. So the design we really want you guys to consider is this idea of thriving people, which is genius, well-being, and role, which means we're designing and bringing out that genius for people to show up in their whole self. And that it really is based in well-being, one that will create conditions for a healthy mindsets and body and spirit. But all of that has to be designed within the conditions of the organization and a value exchange completed or uh, participated in. So when we think about, we won't have time to go through all this today, but when we think about genius, we think about bringing your whole self, which means your why your unlimited energies and passions and the place that you could put all this to work. And so we often talk about, when we talk about bringing your genius, it's bringing your whole self. It's those deep convictions. It's that unlimited energy that gives you the, the desire to stay up late at night or to, to go do the things you really are passionate about doing, but to do all of that in the context of relationships. And so when we think about these three things and how this could change design, it's substantial. And I don't have all of this here. You can download the workbook, the mini workbook that we have. But I just laid out, when you think about purpose, your deep why, what are you willing to struggle for? You know, those are the things we're looking for people to be fulfilled. And we know if they're fulfilled in the workplace, they're going to bring even more energy into their relationships and into customer relationships or partner relationships. And we know that if we can really begin to create and nurture conditions for unlimited energy, your passions, where you're, you are able to engage in a way that, you know, says something different about why you're doing what you're doing. We ask that question sometimes, what did your eight-year-old self love doing? Could you remember that energy? Where it wasn't about productivity, it was about just being and being a part of it. 
And then we also say that genius can't show up unless it's in relationship. So we say purpose, passion, and place. It's where you're taking your purpose and your passion, passion, and you're bringing it in con connection. So now, can you imagine a whole team, 5, 10, 20, 100 people, or 1,000 people, who begin to say that we're coming together and we're designing around these things to create the conditions for us to all collectively thrive in a way that allows the organization to achieve its purpose. But we should not be designing organizations in a way that would be at the expense of the people that are a part of them. So if we design this way, we begin to unlock what has been unrealized in most organizations and in most situations. The genius that we all can bring into the workplace. So when you step back and you think about it, if we can change the design of that organization, create conditions for you and your team members and other colleagues to thrive, it changes the outcomes. And so all of that brings the conditions of recognizing what has already started showing in research. That, you know, those who begin to engage their team members and their staff, you know, show two and a half times greater revenue growth double the annual net income, less accidents, less absent days, more customer advocacy, you know, lower turnover. It, this, this is a better design. And it is about being completely engaged. And we take engagement to a whole nother level. This is not just making sure people are heard. It's actually designing around their whole self. And we believe that these numbers don't even give it justice. That in reality, what we're really looking for is that abundance. Unlimited potential, resilience, thriving members, transform transformative systems change, emergent outcomes, things that we couldn't predict. It's not linear. I love, I often talk about that within the InRhythm team, that well, we have some recent new members to our team and, and say we're different now. So that means the future is different. And what can we do to design around the uniqueness that has shown up? And what can we continually do in asking ourselves those questions? Genius energy in an organization is about people. And if we can design around the genius that gives people energy, it will give energy to others. And this is what would change everything. So then I'm just going to end with this question. Why should an organization design with your genius as a consideration? Why should an organization design with your genius as a consideration? We've got some comments coming through in the chat. I hope you hold this question close because what I find from an equity standpoint is that a lot of us are seeking for something to be different, but unfortunately it's not accessible to everyone. And what does it look like if you can pursue genius in your organization, how do we make it available to everybody? That just excites me more than anything else. So thank you, everyone. So we'll just open it up to questions or comments. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll stop sharing and, and we'll open it up. Thanks, Trey. Like you said, please unmute yourselves. Feel free to speak up. We'd love to hear your voices, ask questions. Um, Trey is here. 
Hi, friend. How are you? Very good. Um, I have one question which I posted on, on the chat. Um, do you know what type of organizations or whether that study that you mentioned in that web page, uh, what type of organizations took part in that survey? Yes, I, I, I can go pull the exact data, but it's a cross section of multiple industries. Okay. So, and, and I, so I would it's say- not, It's not yeah, like big corporations or, okay. Yeah, yeah it's a combination of both small uh, medium size and large organizations, but a cross sector of industry. Okay, thanks. Was it primarily um, businesses or did it also include nonprofits and education and counties and tribes? Yeah, no, I, I would say that that study in particular was mostly around uh, businesses, but I um, would say that and, and many have heard me say this, that some of the most extractive places that need to change are the cause-based organizations. Um, and, and I would think that there, there's even more reasons why we should reconsider our design. Uh, so, but it wasn't included in that study, Becky. I, I'm sure there are some others, but not that one. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the presentation, Trey. If, if I could ask um, for maybe uh, how the elephant in the room fits uh, the notion of fiduciary responsibility, how, how does that either um, take a back seat or become part of this, this process that you're talking about in your mind? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think the, um, there's two ways for us to think about um, uh, the fiduciary responsibilities. One is, is we change what the fiduciary's responsibility is. And there are a lot of legal designations that are changing that, where it's not just a mirror of financial return, it's a mirror of financial and public good. And, and I think that is starting to be embraced uh, in many different countries uh, around the world. Secondly, and this is what I'd say to my CEO friends, which I have many of, that are really concerned that this is going to reduce their own profitability. I would say their current models are flawed. And the reason why they are flawed is we are making something work with a workforce that is disengaged, generally speaking. And there isn't a single entrepreneur or CEO that I know that wouldn't want to change that. And they know it's influencing productivity. I've got some incredible studies. I just worked with a healthcare institution, a large medical um, hospital and clinics in the Northwest part of the United States. And we estimated that when a doctor turns over in that hospital system, over a period of five years, it costs them over a million dollars. Because of retraining, redeploying, reassessing, educating, positioning, all of that. And I think we've externalized all those costs and not really recognize how significant it's impacting our current operations. And so from a fiduciary, just strictly financial fiduciary standpoint, I believe we've got a lot of work to do, even in the current model that would change how this would show up. And so, I feel like we have the ability uh, to make a case for it to be financially responsible to move in this direction, not just socially responsible. Thanks, that, that helps a little bit. I, I think um, as, as a CEO, like wearing that hat, um, I, I'm trying to figure out things that can be put into the organization, which I think of as the bylaws that constrain anyone, including me, from doing things that are caustic to the people, the community, and the environment. And um, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm hungry for tools to do that so that it's more than just my understanding and my goodwill that there are things that actually 
um, do constrain the actions of, of boards to act in different ways. Absolutely. Yeah. So Bradley, I, I would um, not only agree with that, I, we put a strong emphasis on governance and it to be collective governance so that it does show up both in bylaws or agreements that we've all collectively say are important to us so that it doesn't put an unnecessary um, constraint on the, uh, the real energy in the organization um, to the benefit of external shareholders. The other thing we really encourage is that, you know, the relationship we have currently with um, investors or outside shareholders has created toxicity that um, I think can be addressed, both in bylaws as well as in just how we see the uh, all partners a part of the ecosystem versus this kind of mentality of an internal team and an external uh, partner. So if they're all a part of the ecosystem, how do we engage and, and bring them into that conversation? So I think there's all kinds of incredible things like that that we can do to build it into it. And I really, we use those principles that we laid out as a way to both filter and design conversations around that. Is this holistic? You know, is this really embracing the interdependence? Is this something that allows for the uniqueness to show up or is it shut down? Is this developmental? And we've got, we've had really good success in getting investors to consider those dynamics as well. Other questions? Awesome. Well, guys, I, uh, in rhythm, our team is here to, uh, to be a resource for all of you as you begin to uh, consider these kinds of, of designs. Uh, we have no, uh, we, are, we are biased. We embrace life as a design and know that it's going to be messy as we all collectively begin to design this way. I think it brings out the collective creativity of all of us. So thank you for giving us your time. Thank you for uh, considering a different option, a different design, where genius is at the center and the energy of the people are at the center of our design versus something else. So with that, I'll pass it back to Rachel. Thanks, Trey. Yeah, thank you everyone for being here today. Just wanted to um, also mention that we have a design lab. If anyone's interested, Bradley, you spoke about tools. I think you said craving tools to make this change. Um, and that's a great place to start. There are great testimonies there and videos you can watch um, of people that have, have been through it. We have some people who are currently in it that are on this call as well. So um, just check that out as well. But thank you guys. We will send you the presentation and the recording from today. And also just encourage you to download that workbook. It's really great to do as an individual or as a team um, or as an organization. So have a look at that as well. But Jane also posted in the chat, please reach out for one-on-ones. We would love to chat more and yeah, enjoy the rest of your day or your evening, wherever you are in the world. Thanks, thank you, Rachel. everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you.